based on Schwann's maxim that truth does not deny forms from the outside, but transcends them from within, Professor Kutzinger's paper, Hezekiah, an orthodox opening to esoteric ecumenism, will address the question of how one can remain within the Christian form while at the same time acknowledging the truth as such and honoring its expressions in other religions. Where is Christianity's innermost innermost point of transcendence. This comes very nicely after the, the talk preceding it. Ah, how nice. How are you? This is a once in a lifetime moment. I'm surrounded already by friends, and one of my greatest friends, Houston Smith, has just walked into the room. Very happy to have you here. Let me say before beginning my paper that I very, very much agree with Vincent Rossi, who pointed out this morning that in a conference like this, where our focus is on common spiritual teachings, there should nonetheless be no sweeping under the rug, I think was his phrase, no sweeping under the rug of our differences. And my hope in what follows is to remind us keenly of the most important of all doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam, while at the same time suggesting a method for its resolution. So I am yet another delegation from Najran, and we'll see whether our dialogue turns out differently today. When I first began planning this conference nearly two years ago, I never imagined that its theme would prove so timely. Had we any doubts before, the events of this past September 11th and their continuing repercussions throughout the world have proven conclusively that interfaith understanding is today more important than ever, and that no discussion is more urgently needed than that between Christians and Muslims. We know that during his captivity in Asia Minor in the 14th century, the Orthodox Archbishop, St. Gregory Palamas, greatly impressed by the kindness of the Muslims he met, became close friends with the son of the Turkish emir, with whom he had many conversations. And in one of the letters which he wrote at that time, St. Gregory expressed his hope that a day will soon come when we shall be able to understand each other. Now, nearly 700 years later, one prays all the more for such a day. But what exactly is the understanding we seek, and what kind of dialogue are we called to engage in? There are those for whom interreligious understanding means doctrinal compromise. It is assumed in this case that religions are the creation of man, that dogmas are the lingering effects of a credulous and uncritical age, and that the surest way to tolerance and peace lies in the elimination or humanistic reconstruction of teachings that have served as the excuse for divisiveness and hatred in the past. Thus, there are Christians, to pick the most obvious example from my own tradition, who insist that the only way to honor the convictions of other religious people is to jettison the idea of Christ's divinity, an idea often joined to the belief that Christianity is uniquely true and salvific. Because traditional faith in the only begotten has so often been confused with an ideology of the only correct, it has seemed to these liberal ecumenists that the dogma must be discarded. And it is no surprise, given the reductionist tone of conversation in the West concerning the religions, that such Christians have enjoyed a certain amount of success in promoting this kind of dialogue with their counterparts in other religious traditions. Jesus was a preacher and a gifted teacher, they say, but there was nothing about him of a supernatural or miraculous order. No virgin birth, no walking on the water or exorcism of demons, 
and no physical resurrection from the dead. Now, of course, a reductionist mindset is not the only explanation for the success of such ventures, and I do not mean to be simplistic. Clearly, a considerable measure of good must come from the discovery, however occasioned, that people who practice different religions from our own are human too. And we would seriously err, especially in these turbulent and frightening times, to dismiss or belittle any well-intentioned effort to overcome prejudice and xenophobia. But we would also err if we ignored the fact that dialogue of the kind I have described thus far, besides being based upon a lie about Christ, cannot help but contribute to the very problems it aims to solve. For it is in the very nature of things that pious believers will seize all the more strongly upon their convictions and with all the more unthinking fervor when they feel themselves threatened with a betrayal coming from their own co-religionists. The ecumenism of the demythologizers is certainly not the only cause of religious retrenchment. Nevertheless, liberal dialogues and exclusivist monologues, to use Professor Nast's terms from last evening, modernism and fundamentalism, remain like two sides of one coin. And it is only the shortest of steps from the substitution of a purely human teacher for the incarnate second person of the Holy Trinity to the insistence that a conscious and explicit commitment to Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. Is there any way out of this impasse? Is it possible, in other words, for people who follow different spiritual paths to acknowledge the presence of saving truth in one another's religions, but without undermining the dogmatic foundations of their own? To refer specifically to the traditions represented at this conference and to put my question in a yet more pointed way, is it possible for an orthodox Christian like myself to respect Islam as a fully valid religion revealed by the same God whom I worship, but without denying what my own tradition teaches me about the divinity of Jesus Christ? even though, as we know, what Muslims believe concerning this same Jesus, son of Mary, is so considerably different? I believe very firmly that the answer is yes. Indeed, I would go further and say that an affirmative response to these questions is not simply possible, it is necessary. For Christian faith in Christ, if genuine and if pursued to its depths, is inseparable from the double precept that we should touch but not cling. I have in mind Christ's words in John chapter 20. Speaking on the one hand to Thomas, Jesus commands him to stretch forth his hand to place it in my side, and to be not faithless but believing. And Thomas's response is the greatest confession of all in the scriptures. My Lord and my God. On the other hand, speaking to Mary Magdalene, Christ instructs her, do not hold me. The Greek verb hapto means to bind something fast. For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Taken together, these two commandments provide the model for every Christian's proper relation to Jesus. One is to reach out and touch him as my Lord and my God acknowledging and embracing his true divinity, but without clinging to the outward manifestation of that divinity, and thus without binding him in a way that would obstruct his ascent and ours with him to his Lord and his God. This double relationship between the Christian and Christ adumbrates in the idiom of one religion, 
a more general relationship found in all religions between the outward or exoteric form and the inward or esoteric truth which that form conveys. And it opens us to the possibility of a different kind of dialogue, one based upon a common understanding of the metaphysical essence of traditional teachings and not limited by their dogmatic expressions. As many in my audience know, the Swiss philosopher and perennialist author Frithjof Schuon, who has been quoted by speakers before me, has described this as an esoteric ecumenism. And he insists throughout his many books that it is only a soterism which can avoid the dilemma that I was speaking of earlier. It is obvious, Shuan writes, that the narrowly literal belief of exclusivist dogmatism, while feasible within a closed system knowing nothing of other traditional worlds, has become untenable and dangerous in a universe where everything meets and interpenetrates. The solution, however, is not the false ecumenism of the liberals, which abolishes doctrine, and which, as Shuan sharply notes, in order to reconcile two adversaries, strangles them both. <laughs> no, a true ecumenism must honor and uphold the importance of traditional dogmas. Irreconcilable as they may appear exoterically, while at the same time appealing on the basis of prayer and contemplative insight to, and I finish the quotation from Shuan, to the wisdom that can discern the one sole truth under the veil of different forms. What this means for our conference will perhaps be surprising to some. It means, and again I am quoting from Shuan, that the Christian must be really Christian and the Muslim really Muslim however paradoxical this may seem in view of the spiritual communion that has to be established between them. For both parties, precisely for the sake of the mutual understanding they seek, are obliged to adopt, Shuan's words again, to adopt points of departure which are extrinsically and provisionally separative, not because they are separative or exclusive, but because by their intrinsic veracity, they guarantee a true intuition of unity. For those not familiar with the perennialist perspective, this is a subtle but extremely important point and it needs to be emphasized. We are to take traditional doctrines seriously, not out of some sentimental and ill-conceived nostalgia for the past, and certainly not with condescension toward those presumed to have a simpler and less intelligent faith than our own. One honors these teachings because they are true and because they provide, each in its own way and within the symbolic and ritual context of a given tradition, an opening onto the truth as such. It is only by conforming to holy separation at the base Shuan therefore writes, that we can realize holy union at the summit. One can attain to the latter only by first perceiving the element of unity in the revealed form itself and by loving this form as an expression of the supraformal. End of quotation. What this implies concretely is that in a dialogue such as ours, the Christian interlocutor can expect to reach a sympathetic understanding of Islam only by a continued insistence that Christ was indeed God incarnate and not merely a prophet. The Christian must embrace this teaching with his full conviction, stretching forth his hand like Thomas in worshipful reverence to Jesus and communicating in his divine body and blood. For it is by this means that he will come to hear finally the words given to Mary, words spoken in the privacy and freshness of that first Paschal garden. Do not hold me back, but come with me into the very heights of the real, for there is no God but God. Now, of course, 
to place the central teachings of Christianity and Islam so closely side by side is bound to create something of a shock. And this juxtaposition will prove especially jolting for traditional Christians who will strongly resist the suggestion that the Jesus of the Gospels was himself a witness to Muslim Tawheed that Professor Chittick and Professor Shakazami have been speaking about and who will therefore find themselves, these Christians, from the start, deeply suspicious of the dialogue I am here proposing. Surely, they will say, there is an unbridgeable difference between the belief that Christ was just one in a series of human messengers and the belief that he is God. And they may well suppose that the perennialists have done no less an act of violence to their religion than the liberals. I have elsewhere undertaken a doctrinal response to these criticisms and have attempted to explain in some detail how the formal dogmas of Christology promulgated by the early councils of the church themselves open up precisely to this esoteric equivalence. Nor, as I have endeavored to show, is this a question simply of some contrived and procrustean compatibility. For unless we choose to be heretics, we Christians, our tradition forbids us to think that the second person of the Trinity is the same as the first, or that his divinity was confined to the historical individuality of Jesus alone. On the contrary, in contemplating the mystery of the two natures in the single person of Christ, we must remember that it was not the Father who was incarnate in Jesus, nor was it some particular man alone, but man as such, who was hypostatically assumed into God. Indeed, we ourselves are that man in our essential humanity, and the God who took us into himself was the logos, or word, whose divinity is itself derived from a yet more ultimate source. The Father, he himself tells us, is greater than I. Jesus is most certainly God, and the perennialist would be among the first to defend the miraculous truth of that stunning ellipsis. But this does not mean that saving power was fully expended a single moment of history, or that we should confuse the uniqueness of him who was incarnate, the only begotten Son of God, with the human particularity of Jesus of Nazareth. There is only one eternal Son and one Logos, and no man, he tells us, comes to the Father except by me. But nowhere do the creeds oblige us to equate this transcendent uniqueness with a singularity of the factual or temporal order. Today, however, my topic is not doctrine but method. I would like to look once again at the Christological question so as to better understand the inward unanimity between the Christian and Muslim approaches to Christ. But I shall do so in a different and somewhat indirect way by focusing our discussions on prayer. The goal is much the same, to encourage Christians, especially my fellow Orthodox, to keep their minds open to the possibilities of an esoteric ecumenism. But rather than examining the implications of traditional dogma as such, I wish to call your attention instead to the contemplative practice of the Christian East. When a man seeks to escape from dogmatic narrowness, Shuan has written, it is essential that it be upwards and not downwards. For truth does not deny forms from the outside, but transcends them from within. As I shall suggest in what follows, there is no better way of understanding what this transcendence or inward ascent might involve for the Christian than to consider that distinctive method of prayer described in the Philokalia and other traditional sources which we know by the name of hesychasm, and which of course has been touched on by the other two Christian speakers today. Of course, in the emphasis that it places upon the mystical and interior life, the East itself is already a kind of ascent within the larger tradition, 
an opening in the Christian carapace to truths of a less formal and less juridical order. But the hesychia, which has been sought by its masters as the final goal of their way, points us even further upward and inward to an opening within the opening, inviting us into the very heart of a distinctively Christian esoterism. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's beautiful. (laughs) It is customary for authorities on Eastern Christian spirituality to distinguish several senses of the term hezekia, a word, as we learned this morning, often simply translated as stillness. And in doing so, they sometimes call attention to one of the apothegmata that we find among the sayings of the Desert Fathers. We are told that when the Abba Arsenius was still living in the city, he prayed to God, asking to be shown the path of salvation. And in response, a voice came to him from heaven and said, Arsenius, be solitary, be silent, be at rest. These are the roots of a life without sin. Only the last of these imperatives employs a cognate of the word hezekia itself, but is traditionally understood from the way in which the teaching is expounded in other fathers that the practice of hezekasm includes all three of the dimensions contained in this answer to the Abba's prayer. Corresponding to the threefold structure of the human microcosm, there is first a physical or a bodily hezekia, which is apparent in the isolation of the hermit, Be solitary, were the heavenly words. Thus, on the material and most external level of our being, we are hesychasts when we retreat from the world and live alone, exchanging our life in society, or perhaps even the cinnabitical life of a cloistered monk, for the life of an anchorite. This is the mode of hesychia that St. Gregory of Sinai has in mind in teaching that The practice of stillness is one thing, and that of community life is another. And it is in the same vein that Evagrius Ponticus, himself styled the solitary, advises us, if you cannot attain stillness where you now live, consider living in exile. Second, there is a hezekia, as it were, of the soul, which one observes above all in refraining from speech. Be silent said the voice to Arsenius. In this case, we become hesychasts, not in taking flight from the companionship of other men, but in guarding our tongues, and in deliberately withdrawing, whether permanently or at certain set times, from verbal communication with our fellows. It is to this dimension of the method that St. Thalassius the Libyan refers in warning that only spiritual conversation is beneficial, It is better to preserve stillness than to indulge in any other kind. There remains, however, yet a third kind of stillness, hezekia proper, suggested to Arsenius by the words be at rest, hezekhadze in Greek. This, we discover, is a spiritual stillness, a hezekia corresponding to the level of man's noose or intellect, and distinguished, say the fathers, by an inward state of complete serenity, immobility, and peace. By far the most difficult of all to attain, this truest and deepest form of hesychasm consists in a solitude that is no longer contingent upon one's location in space, and in a silence that is independent of speech. Reproving the monk, who supposes that his desert cave is enough, St. Simeon, the new theologian, stresses that a stillness understood merely in terms of withdrawal from the world is of absolutely no benefit if we are lazy and negligent. And according to one of the most famous of the desert sayings, it was revealed to St. Anthony the Great, called the father of monks, that there was a busy physician living in the midst of the city who was his spiritual equal. With these and similar texts in mind, Bishop Callistos Ware has remarked that 
Solitude is a state of soul, not a matter of geographical location. It seems from other sources that we would be justified in extending his observation to a further level, adding that true silence is a state of the spirit and not a matter of audible communication. Thus, St. John Cashin, warning about the wiles we must be on our guard against in our battles with the demon called self-esteem, he calls our attention to the fact that when this demon cannot persuade a man to feel proud of his eloquence, it entices him through silence into thinking he has achieved stillness. Such an admonition would obviously not be necessary if silence and stillness were exactly the same, or if keeping our mouths shut were sufficient for entering into peace. But no, even as solitude is no guarantee of silence, so silence is no guarantee of serenity. There is instead yet another deeper and considerably rarer level of hezekiah, where one is no longer distracted even by an inward interlocutor, and where the space of the heart remains unencumbered even by the conversations that we so often have with ourselves. As we learned this morning, the fathers of the Philokalia often describe this third form of stillness as a freedom from thoughts. As we read their writings, however, what we soon discover is that the term itself, thought, has several meanings. And there are accordingly, even within the domain of this profoundest kind of hezekiah, several distinct degrees of freedom, and so depths within depths. At a first and most superficial level, thoughts, Logismoi is the term in the Greek. My apologies to the Greeks in the audience. One can't get over an Erasmian pronunciation once you're taught that in school, but logismi, is that right? Well, logismoi, I'll say. Thoughts are taken to mean specifically bad thoughts or temptations provoked by the demons, which attack a man through the two lower parts of his soul, either through the appetitive and desiring power which, when uncurbed, gives rise to lust and gluttony, or through the insensitive and irascible power, whence comes the temptation to anger. St. Nilus, the ascetic, seems to be speaking mainly of the former when he explains that stillness will in time free the intellect from being disturbed by impure thoughts. While in the Bible, St. Paul refers to thoughts proceeding from the latter source, the irascible power, when he prays that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. As it happens, however, this same passage from Scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, provides the Hesychast with good reason for thinking that true stillness is something still deeper, involving more than just freedom from the obvious seductions of the world and their resulting passionate thoughts. For what St. Paul actually says in the Greek of this verse is that men should pray without dialogismos, a word which can be translated as quarrel or argument, but which also means any mode of dialogue or conversation or debate, whether taking an external or an internal form, and thus even more fundamentally, any effect or operation of the mind. In order to pray as he ought, it is therefore essential for the Hesychast to undertake a much subtler detachment and to cultivate an inward state uncompromised by the sense impressions, visual memories, and other conceptual contents, which are at once the causes and the consequences of discursive consciousness. No longer are thoughts to be understood merely as the grosser images of sensuality, greed, and violence that dominate the thinking of the worldly man. The logismoi from which one is obliged to escape are instead the very apparatus of conceptual reasoning. Here again, however, we find that there is more than one level, and different texts from the fathers call attention to different dimensions of consciousness. On the one hand, certain passages are focused primarily on thoughts which flow from our perception of the physical world and which are responsible for giving shape to empirical data. 
when your intellect withdraws from the flesh and turns away from all thoughts that have their source in sense perception, memory, or the soul body structure, says Evagrius, then you may conclude that you are close to the frontiers of prayer. Similarly, St. Hesychius the Presbyter counsels that we should pursue with all our strength that perfect stillness of heart and blessed state of soul that comes when the mind is free from all images, a state he is quick to add, which is all too rarely found in man. Meanwhile, St. Gregory of Sinai teaches that we have begun to attain to a state of pure Hezekiah only when the intellect sees neither itself nor anything in a material way. On the contrary, he continues, it is often drawn away even from its own senses by the light acting within it. For now it grows immaterial and filled with spiritual radiance. As this last formulation suggests, yet another level of withdrawal is possible. For there remains a final movement of inward ascent, one in which ideas as such are set aside and transcended, quite apart from any empirical or sensory basis. In this case, the noose or intellect, which is the seat of man's intuitive powers of apprehension, and which, when activated through purgation, affords him an immediate knowledge of essences, becomes detached, says St. Gregory, even from its own senses. And the category of logismoi is thus expanded to include every object of consciousness, whether originating from a physical or a spiritual source. One notes, for example, that when St. John Climacos writes that Hezekiah is a laying aside of thoughts. He does not qualify the term. It is not simply bad thoughts or thoughts arising from the senses or thoughts which take the form of visual images, but thoughts in themselves that are to be placed in suspension. The teaching is reinforced by St. Hezekias who calls his reader to a stillness of mind unbroken by thoughts which appear to be good. And St. Gregory of Sinai takes the further step of insisting that even thoughts which are good, and not merely those appearing that way, must be renounced by the true hesychast. For, and I quote, stillness means the shedding of all thoughts for a time, even those which are divine and engendered by the spirit. Otherwise, through giving them our attention, because they are good, we will lose what is better. As we learned this morning from Father John, Paisius the Elder taught precisely the same, that the soul must be cleansed of all thoughts, he said, whether positive or negative. What these spiritual masters are describing at this deepest of all levels of stillness is the operative parallel to the doctrinal apophaticism for which Eastern Christianity is so well known and which, of course, is so forcefully expressed in the works of St. Dionysius the Areopagite. According to Dionysius, the supra-essential being of God is at a total remove from every condition, movement, life, Imagination, conjecture, name, discourse, thought, conception, being, rest, dwelling, unity, limit, infinity, the totality of existence. And it therefore follows, if we wish to approach this God in true prayer, that, he says, we call a halt to the activities of our mind. Just as Moses entered into the darkness in his confrontation with God, so must we leave behind everything that is observed, writes St. Gregory of Nyssa. Not only what sense comprehends, but also what the intelligence thinks it sees. For in this way, says St. Dionysius again, by an undivided and absolute abandonment of yourself and of everything, shedding all and freed from all, 
you will be uplifted to the ray of the divine shadow, which is above everything that is. Many passages in the Philokalia underscore the necessity of this same final abandonment. Do not think that avarice consists simply in the possession of silver or gold, writes St. Peter of Damascus. It is present whenever our thought is attached to something, however noble or true. Therefore, as St. Diodicus of Photiki teaches, true poverty, the fak of the Sufis, can be attained only through a mode of prayer, deep stillness, and complete detachment, in which, the saint says, a man sets himself utterly at naught. Here we come finally, then, to the innermost goal of our quest. In order to be truly still, we discover, it is not enough for a man to live alone, or to refrain from speaking, or to resist temptation, or to close his eyes, or to think without images. If he wishes to pray without dialogismos, like a true hesychast, he must become, in the words of St. Hesychius, totally empty of form. Shuan has said that in an authentic esoterism, truth does not deny forms from the outside, but transcends them from within. And we've been trying to glimpse what this inward transcendence might involve for the Christian by tracing the depths within depths of Eastern teaching on stillness. But transcendence is not denial. And we would seriously err if we supposed that hesychasm is meant to culminate in mental nebulosity or in a collapse of concentration and contemplative focus. On the contrary, as St. Hesychius and the other fathers understood this process, becoming empty of form is not the same as having no outward form or support. And detachment from every object of consciousness must not be confused with an abandonment of consciousness as such. Pure concentration also is prayer, writes Shuan, a concentration which is none other than silence. But this silence can be of operative value, he adds, only on condition that it have a traditional basis and be centered on the divine. The Hezekast masters were well aware of this principle. And while insisting that we should set aside every thought and go beyond every form, they never relinquished their fidelity to one particular thought, nor their dependence on a central and indispensable form. What I have in mind, of course, is their methodic use of the name. As we've already learned at this conference, the spirituality of the Christian East, in addition to its characteristic stress upon stillness, has also been distinguished historically by its practice of invocatory or monologic prayer. This is a method of contemplative orison, found also among the Sufis, of course, in their practice of dhikr, which involves the continual repetition of a single word or short formula as an aid to concentration. In the case of hesychasm, the word in question is usually the name of Jesus, which is pronounced either on its own or more commonly as a part of a brief petition often called the Jesus Prayer, consisting of the words or some slight variation, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. A prayer of this kind can be used by the Christian in a variety of ways and on several levels, not the least important being as a personal plea for help in times of danger and trouble, or as an expression of devotion and love for the person of the Savior. But for the spiritual masters, it has also had a strictly yogic or contemplative purpose, which is to serve as a focus and a point of stability in our efforts to overcome distraction and to eliminate thoughts. 
Let the remembrance of Jesus be united with your every breath, writes St. John Climacos. And then you will know the value of stillness. For through this remembrance, St. Philotheus of Sinai explains, you can concentrate your scattered intellect, calming and unifying the turbulent and wandering mind. In more recent times, St. Theophon the Recluse has offered the same advice. If you wish to stop the continual jostling of your thoughts, he writes, you must bind the mind with one thought, or the thought of one only, namely the thought of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, though, we encounter a paradox Something of the same paradox I think Mr. Rossi was speaking of this morning. As we have seen, the distinguishing aim of the Hezekiah's method of prayer, Hezekiah itself, consists in a freedom from all conceptual forms. Our goal is a state of radical simplicity and purity, in which the mind is no longer occupied with the thought of anything, even, say the Father, something good and divine a state of utter openness and emptiness that only God himself and no conception can fill. In order that we might enter this state, however, we must deliberately retain the thought of Jesus. How is that possible? Is it not a contradiction to think that we can become genuine hesychasts while at the same time keeping ourselves bound to the form of his name? It must be admitted, I believe, that in many of the Eastern Christian fathers there is a contradiction. And that in spite of their continuing praise of contemplative stillness, what we find instead in their writings, whether in the Philokalia or elsewhere, is that a sentimental and devotional attachment to the incarnate person of Christ has in fact taken center stage in their practice. Here I must agree with Shuan and disagree with Mr. Rossi. There is little doubt, for example, that the purity of true Hezekiah has been severely compromised, or at least greatly mitigated, in the teaching of St. Theodorus, the great ascetic, when he advises his reader to think of the blessings which await the righteous, how they will stand at Christ's right hand, the gracious voice of the Master, the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, or again, that sweet light, the endless joy, never interrupted by grief, those heavenly mansions, life with the angels, and all the other promises made to those who fear the Lord. For, this same writer concludes, unless a soul is strengthened with these thoughts, it cannot achieve stillness. There's no denying, of course, don't mistake me here, that imaginative anticipations of this kind can be a powerful aid to a man's devotional piety. And one can have no objection to the important part they play in the discursive prayers of the Christian, nor indeed to their presence among the provisional and preparatory meditations of the Hesychast himself. And yet it is surely just as obvious that such thoughts as those I have just described, motivated as they are by individual interest and colored by specific scriptural and other traditional images, cannot but clutter and distract the mind when it is seeking to enter into the deepest dimension of stillness. Clearly they must be set aside with the other thoughts, at least at certain times, if the final goal is to be realized. But I return to my question. How is this possible if one is praying the Jesus prayer? Petitions, by their very nature, are constructed from concepts. They pertain to objects, and they express thoughts. I've called into question the advice of St. Theodorus, but one might well ask in his defense how any man even one who guards his imagination more closely can pray the Jesus prayer 
without thoughtfully considering the words that he's using and without allowing his attention to be shaped by their meaning. How am I to bind my thoughts by this thought without thinking about it? You may say that I'm exaggerating the difficulty of the method and that in demanding from our minds a thoughtless thought, I've put the matter in too elliptical and problematic a fashion. Consider, though, the words of St. Gregory of Sinai. Unceasingly cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. And, he adds at once, do not allow yourself to retain any concept, object, thought, or form that is supposedly divine, or any sequence of argument or any color. How can we do that? How are we to invoke a formula containing Christ's name without our minds becoming enmeshed in its form? The answer has to do in part, I believe, with what is meant by the name. Preaching the good news of Christ's redemptive death in a much quoted passage from the fourth chapter of Acts, the apostle Peter proclaimed, that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As the Christians in my audience know, this is a text often cited by exclusivists in defense of their belief that a conscious commitment to Jesus is the only sure path to God. In their case, you see, the word name is taken to mean a proper name. And the name of Jesus is understood to be the appellation of a specific figure of history, Jesus of Nazareth, without whom salvation would not be possible. This, of course, is a perfectly legitimate and straightforward reading of the verse in question. For on one important and very obvious level, the name Jesus surely is the name of Jesus. It is doubtless true also that when St. Peter used the term name in this context, he was thinking specifically of the incarnate Son of God, the one who was crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Nevertheless, it would be very wrong to assume that this is the only possible reference of the term, and to conclude, therefore, that the name can mean only, or even that it does mean primarily, a given human name of the Logos. Those who would have us restrict the word to this single level of reference have failed to consider at least four telling points. They have forgotten, first, that Jesus is but one of numerous ways of referring to the Son of God in the Scriptures many of which clearly bear a more universal significance than the proper name of a man. St. Gregory the Theologian provides this partial list of Christ's biblical names. Image, vapor, emanation, effulgence, creator, king, head, law, door, foundation, rock, pearl, righteousness, Sanctification, redemption, man, servant, shepherd, lamb, high priest, sacrifice, firstborn of creation, firstborn of the dead. It would obviously be absurd to suppose that the divine person thus described in these terms is deprived of his saving power when the specific name Jesus is not being used. The name of Jesus, one begins to see, must be something more than these two syllables alone. Second, unless we wish to side with the heretical modalists who suppose that the three distinct names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit apply alike to a single person, we must admit that the name itself, Jesus, is not uniquely salvific. For, taking it strictly as a proper name, it clearly leaves unnamed the other two hypostases of the Holy Trinity, upon whom salvation depends nonetheless, and whose own names must also be regarded as sacred. The Christian is reminded of this fact, of course, every time he prays the Lord's Prayer. 
asking that the Father's name should be hallowed. It is of considerable interest to note, by the way, that at least one early Christian authority seems to have acknowledged the saving efficacy of an invocation based upon the name of the Father and employed by the followers of another religion who never used the proper name of the Son. St. Irenaeus writes that just as all things are subject to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so must they also be subject to his name who made and established all things by his word, that is the Father. For this reason, Irenaeus continues, the Jews, even now, that is during Irenaeus' lifetime, put demons to flight by means of this very adjuration, inasmuch as all beings fear the invocation of him who created them. Besides his own, Irenaeus knew of no other orthodox religion than Judaism. But surely, given this ancient precedent, there is no reason for the Christian of our day to deny a like efficacy to the name of Allah. Yet a third point is this. Quite apart from the question of its proper or particular usage, the word name is often used in the Bible not in reference to a specific person at all, but as a synonym for authority and power above all that of God. And in the context of Acts chapter 4, where the subject is the divine saving presence that was embodied in Jesus, it is certainly this meaning that must be regarded as central. To say with St. Peter that there is salvation in no other name is not to name Jesus uniquely. It is a way instead of underscoring his intrinsic divinity. We Orthodox see this deeper meaning of the name portrayed in many of our icons of Christ where inscribed within the nimbus surrounding his head, one finds not the proper name Jesus, but the Greek words ho'on, the one who is, referring, of course, to the name of God given to Moses on Horeb. Finally, there is a fourth reason for rejecting the claim that salvation is limited by the name itself, Jesus and hence for a methodical detachment from the specific person thus named. And it is a reason which Orthodox Christians, with their stress upon mystery and the way of negation, should be quick to understand. We have said that Jesus is only one of the names of God's Son, that the Father and the Holy Spirit have their own saving names, and that the word itself, name, connotes divine presence and power, regardless of the given form which that presence might take. But we must also remember that the ultimate source of divinity in the unknowable Godhead, however many names it might take in this world, cannot be named as it is in itself. Although rightly praised by every name, says St. Dionysius, it is finally best named the nameless one. St. Gregory Palamas, among many others, concurs. The superessential nature of God is not a subject for speech or thought or even contemplation, he writes. And hence, there is no name whereby it can be named, neither in this age nor in the age to come nor word found in the soul and uttered by the tongue. It is still true, of course, that there is salvation in none other than the name of Jesus. And the Hesychast is no less obliged than other Christians to accept and to honor this principle. But at the same time, no Christian, least of all the aspiring Hesychast, should allow himself to forget that Jesus is not the only name of the Son, that the Son is not the only name of God, that God is not the only name of the named, and that the named is truly named by no name.
One well-known authority on the spirituality of the Christian East has written that the Jesus prayer, I'm quoting, is fundamentally Christocentric. We are not simply invoking God, but our words are addressed specifically to Jesus Christ, to God incarnate, the Word made flesh, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who was born in Bethlehem, truly crucified on Golgotha, and truly raised from the dead. The same writer adds, with specific reference to the Sufi practice of dhikr, that, I quote again, a religion such as Islam, which rejects the incarnation, cannot be invoking God in the same way as Hesychasm does. And he suggests that we should compare the invocatory method of prayer to a picture frame. While the specific name that one invokes in any given prayer may be likened to the image within that frame. Despite the resemblances between the frame of the Jesus prayer and certain non Christian frames, he concludes, we should never underestimate the uniqueness of the portrait within the frame. Techniques are subsidiary. It is our encounter face-to-face -face through the prayer with the living person of Jesus that alone has primary value. It seems from Father John's talk this morning that the Archimandrite Sophroni would have said much the same, he who was also familiar with other traditions' methods of prayer. But is this really true? Is it thus and thus only that one may engage in this prayer? The teachings to which I have been calling your attention in this paper seem to suggest otherwise, and I therefore find that I must respectfully disagree with this author. The inner emptiness which the Christian aspirant is encouraged to seek and the inner plenitude of the name which he is taught to invoke prove, if anything, that hesychasm and Sufism are all but identical. Indeed, it is precisely because of the often remarkable parallels between the teachings of certain Eastern fathers and their counterparts in other religious traditions that Christian exoterists, including those of the East, are sometimes mistrustful of the hesychast writers. The Orthodox scholar John Meyendorf, for example, voices his concern about what he calls the individualistic and spiritualized tendency of St. Gregory of Sinai. And much the same reservation is expressed more forcefully by the Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who complains that, quote, the mystical teaching of Evagrius in its fully developed consistency stands closer to Buddhism than Christianity. The criticism of Protestant writers often goes even further, of course, extending to the via negativa as such, and thus to one of the distinguishing marks of the Eastern perspective in general. Luther was doubtless speaking for many others when he wrote that Dionysius is most pernicious. He Platonizes more than he Christianizes. On the other hand, it is certainly true, and I've acknowledged this point already, that the writings of these same fathers are at the same time strongly colored by a devotional attachment to Christ's person. St. Theodorus, whom I quoted earlier, is by no means unique in this respect. In fact, as one quickly discovers in reading the Philokalia and other traditional sources, even the most apophatic of Hesychast authors do not always practice what they preach. And the method of prayer which they follow and promulgate remains, not surprisingly, a largely Bactic one. Shuan has written about the unequal and often disconcerting phenomenon of average Sufism, a Sufism that confuses first principles with the categories of an anthropomorphist and voluntaristic theology. And we must, in all honesty, acknowledge by analogy, an average hesychasm in which the absolute imprescriptibility of the divine essence and the operative rigor of a truly intellective detachment are both sacrificed to the needs of a conventional piety. 
My interests here, however, are not of a historical or textual kind. I'm not asking the question how, in fact, most Eastern Christians have prayed. And my chief concern is not with how best to describe the spirituality disclosed in the surviving works of their major authorities, nor again with whether these writers should be praised or blamed. I am concerned instead with what is possible for the Christian seeker today, especially one who finds himself called to a path of knowledge and who seeks to understand the inner essence of religion, and with whether that Christian, without in any way denying the truth of his own tradition, may acknowledge the equal truth of a way not his own, perhaps even drawing from it an encouragement and nourishment for his own spiritual practice. I believe that he can, and the point of my remarks has been to indicate how the Hezekia of the Christian East might help to point him in the right direction. Historically, of course, the Hezekast writers were not themselves interested in these questions, and most of them would have been just as resistant as many other Christians to the claims of another religion, and hence to the possibility of an esoteric ecumenism. Nor is there anything surprising in this, for as Shuan points out, a man's spirituality cannot be held to depend on knowledge of a historical or geographical kind. And in the case of the fathers, even those who, like St. John Damascene and St. Gregory Palamas, had contact with Islam, it is far from certain whether they encountered Muslims of their own spiritual stature, with whom they could have joined in a truly metaphysical dialogue. Nevertheless, for the Christian today who lives in such different circumstances and who does know about the mystical paths of other religions, the teachings of the Hezekasts can serve as a means for deepening his participation in Christ, while at the same time providing the keys for inwardly transcending whatever limitations those teachers may have felt obliged to impose on themselves. When, as a young man, St. Gregory of Sinai was taken prisoner in a Turkish raid, I do not know where he may have gone, or with what Muslims he may have spoken, or what his spiritual aptitude may have been at the time, or why he entered the monastic life after being released from captivity. But when he tells me to concentrate solely on the pure, simple, formless remembrance of Jesus, I presume that he must have meant what he said, and that he's inviting me to enter into a method of invoking Christ's name which does not involve thinking explicitly about the incarnation, about the one who was born in Bethlehem, truly crucified on Golgotha, and truly raised from the dead. To be incarnate, after all, is to be circumscribed by a form. And a formless form is a sheer contradiction. On the other hand, a formless remembrance is still a remembrance. There's no indication that I should stop invoking the name, which continues to serve as a support for concentration and as a vehicle of divine saving power. But I must do so, it seems, in a way that is deliberately detached from all conceptual contents, and thus from my thoughts, not only about the particularities of the son's earthly life, but even about his person as such. Similarly, when St. Dionysius explains that the wonderful name, which is above every name, is the name of the nameless one, of the hidden divinity which transcends even being, I do not know whether he is speaking as a pseudonymous 5th century Syrian monk or, as my tradition tells me, as a disciple of Paul's. What I do know is that for this same Paul, writing in Philippians chapter 2, the name which is above every name is the name of Jesus. 
And I'm once again obliged to conclude that within the initiatic context of an authentic hesychast method, the meaning of the word Jesus is not limited to the historical and individual order. St. Dionysius adds strength to this conclusion. Every affirmation regarding Jesus' love for humanity, he writes, and it is just such an affirmation that we find in the Jesus prayer, Every affirmation regarding Jesus' love for humanity has the force of a negation pointing toward transcendence. For even though God is fully present in Jesus, I'm continuing the quotation from St. Dionysius, he is hidden even after this revelation, or if I may speak in a more divine fashion, is hidden even amid the revelation. The mystery of Jesus can thus be drawn out by no word or mind, he says. What is to be said of it remains unsayable. What is to be understood of it remains unknowable. If this is true, however, then clearly one's invocation of this name need not, and in the case of the Hesychast, should not, be combined with an exclusive focus upon the incarnate person of Christ, but should be accompanied instead by a gradual detachment of the mind from all associations and categories, whether empirical or dogmatic in character, without in any way, I say again, without in any way denying the miraculous facts of Christ's life or the saving truths of Christological doctrine. The Christian pilgrim must make an effort to abstract from those facts to their essential meaning and to look along those truths toward the truth. For it is thus and thus only that with heaven's help he may come at last to that dimensionless center where in the words of St. Hesychius, the heart sees the God of gods in its depths, a God no longer approached as a distinct object of consciousness, but who himself, the saint adds, is both the seer and the seen. I saw my Lord with the eye of the heart, echoes the Sufi saint Mansur Ahlaj in words quoted last evening by Professor Nas. I said, who art thou? And he answered, thou. According to Marco Paulus, the essential question to be asked of any religious tradition is whether it provides the means for taking a man all the way in the spiritual life, whether, he says, the formal limits are such as to leave an open window looking toward the formless truth, thus allowing for the possibility of its immediate or ultimate realization. Unfortunately, we Christians have tended to keep our shutters closed. Not, of course, that we're lacking in windows, but they're usually made of stained glass or painted on wood, coloring the beams they're designed to transmit. And most Christian authorities, content with their own devotional piety, have done very little to make the serious seeker aware that it is possible for a man to go outside into the fresh morning air. Among the masters of the Christian East, however, as we have seen, one hears at least rumors of openings. And regardless of whether any given one of them was willing to look directly on the white light of the truth, we find scattered hints in their writings as to how we might open a few windows ourselves. The details of their practice are a subject for another time, how precisely to enunciate the invocation and where to place it in the mind or the heart, how to coordinate the repetition of the name with a persevering effort to prescind from all thought, how to support this inner work with the rhythm of one's breathing and movement, 
These are important questions that I have not sought to address in this paper. Nonetheless, I think we can begin glimpsing, at least, the essential aims of the Hesychast method. And what we find, I suggest, is that they mirror the instructions of the risen Lord himself. Thomas, as you will recall, Jnanic patron of those seeking an immediate certitude, was told that he must be patient and begin by touching the form, truly taking hold of what God had revealed. For Jesus is the Son, and the Son is God, and God is the named, and the named is its name, which name for the Christian is Jesus. As for Mary Magdalene, prototype of the Bhakta, she was nonetheless warned against clinging, and thus against confusing the form with the essence. For Jesus is not the only name of the Son, nor is the Son the only name of God, nor is God the only name of the named, and the named is truly named by no name. It was suggested that the method of invocatory prayer is only the picture frame of one's practice, and that it is the portrait of Jesus himself within the Christian frame to whom his followers must direct their undivided attention. But this, it seems, is not the best comparison. If we wish to follow the Hesychast path to the heart, it is Jesus who must be approached as the frame, the frame not of a portrait, but of a window. Seekers living in the Christian house must not turn their backs on this window, supposing it's too narrow to show them the truth. But neither should they remain at a distance, as if they were admiring a favorite painting from across a gallery. They must take a step forward and lift up the sash, placing their head and shoulders inside its ample opening. What they shall see then, of course, is no longer the frame, but instead the bountiful emptiness of a mountain valley, and across its grassy expanse, if they look carefully, the outlines of other houses with other windows, not their own. Thank you very much.